Please welcome our speaker today, Mr. Ken Garrett. Thank you, Ken. And thank you all for coming out here. It is definitely an honor to be here again speaking for EPIC and to certainly have a lot of distinguished uh, audience members, uh, fellow researchers and colleagues and friends. And uh, this should be a lot of fun. I appreciate you all sharing your uh, part of your Sunday afternoon with me. Um, as Ken mentioned, I am a technically a cryptozoologist. And uh, can, can we get a quick show of hands? How many of you are familiar with that term, cryptozoology, cryptozoologist? It's kind of gotten very popular over the past few years because of television shows like Monster Quest and Finding Bigfoot and so forth. Um, cryptozoology essentially is the study uh, and search for evidence of unverified species. That's the technical definition. And it's a movement that actually started back in the 1950s by a uh, Belgian-French zoologist named Bernard Heuvelmans. Before that, there was something known as exotic zoology, where explorers would go out to remote corners of the planet and look for new animal species, fabulous creatures, and so forth. And, um, through the years, cryptozoology has actually gained a pretty strong foothold um, due to the ongoing discovery of new animal species. Those of you that follow different news threads probably realize that new creatures are being discovered all the time in remote corners of the planet. And um, it is true that some of the things that we investigate as cryptozoologists, like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, the Chupacabra, these are all very fabulous notions. And, uh, you know, very hard for, for many people to believe. And, you know, but there is a, a good deal of evidence, most of it anecdotal, that some of these things might be out there. Um, so anyways, that being said, um, as fabulous as something like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster sounds, there's actually some pretty strong scientific foundation behind that. Because we do have creatures in the fossil history that actually fit the descriptions of, for example, Bigfoot. Did you know there were? fossil hominids that lived you know, during the Ice Age, during the Pleistocene, and you know, even hundreds of thousands of years ago that looked like Bigfoot, that were essentially giant, hulking, nine, 10 foot tall, hairy, bipedal primates. Uh, so you know, the, the belief there, I guess, you know, by most researchers is that you know, potentially some of these archaic hominids could have survived into modern times and could be living in remote corners of the planet uh, and could potentially be there. You know, same thing with the Loch Ness Monster. There were, of course, giant marine saurians and um, archaic whales known as zooglodons, things that lived in the Earth's oceans uh, millions of years ago that actually fit the descriptions that are you know, attributed to different eyewitnesses. But in the case of something like flying humanoids, um, I'm really stepping, I, I was stepping a little bit out of my comfort zone with this particular subject because it really goes against the whole grain of science and evolution and the natural world, the notion that there could be something out there that is human-like in form that has wings that, that flies to the air. Evolution just doesn't work that way. You know, there's not really a scientific foundation for it. Um, I guess in some respects you could consider the flying humanoids to be kind of the, the avian or airborne counterparts of mermaids, which I know a lot of people have have uh, been talking about mermaids in recent years because of the, the TV shows which uh, have been coming on and which are very fictional, by the way. But there could, doesn't mean there's something like a mermaid couldn't exist. There's certainly a, a shred of truth behind every legend. At least that's what I believe. So anyways, uh, this particular book um, is kind of what I like to refer to as kind of the fringe areas of cryptozoology because people are most definitely describing some type of winged humanoid creatures. This has been going on apparently for thousands of years uh, across our planet. Um, but, you know, again, there's not a lot of strong scientific foundation here, but there's definitely something going on. And that's, uh, that's what I found through the course of my research. This particular book, um, something that I've been researching for about maybe four or five years. Um, I've been, of course, interested in the Mothman since I was a very young boy. As Ken mentioned, my mother was a big influence on me. She was very adventurous. And when I was a young boy, she used to sit me on her lap and tell me stories about the Yeti. And she always mentioned the West Virginia Mothman. That was one of her, fa one of her favorite stories. And it wasn't too long before I uh, had my nose firmly planted in the books of authors like John Keel, who was actually there uh, in West Virginia investigating the Mothman during the 1960s. 
And, um, but in 2009, um, I received an invitation uh, from the producers of Monster Quest to fly down to Mexico and investigate some recent sightings of creatures like Mothman. And of course, I jumped at the opportunity. I thought it was super cool, you know, super cool adventure of a lifetime. And subsequently, in uh, the next year, in 2010, I did a TV show for the uh, Sci-Fi Network called William Shatner's Weirder What, where they sent me up to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, the actual location uh, where these Mothman sightings took place. So um, a funny thing happens when you appear on television shows or Coast to Coast AM. People start getting in touch with you. And you know, oftentimes, they want to relate or share experiences that they've had with things that you know, that they don't understand with inexplicable experiences they've had. And so as a result of those television appearances, I had different people that emailed me and uh, basically poured their guts out and said, hey, I've never told anybody this, but at such and such time, I saw something like the Mothman, or I saw this human-like creature flying through the air, or whatever. And so that was kind of the impetus to write this particular book, because I felt like, well, I have these kind of new uh, unpublished eyewitness accounts, and there's actually a wealth of, of, of information out there. And it's, quite frankly, it's, not, it's a book that's never really been done before, surprisingly. I mean, there have been books like The Mothman Prophecies by John Keel, which uh, you know, focused on the Mothman phenomenon, specifically in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Um, there are other very good books out there. Um, Alien Animals is one that I read back in the 70s, which was kind of one of the first books to talk about weird flying human-like creatures. Uh, through different UFO books, classic UFO books, there are mentions of these creatures, but no one had ever compiled all of the information, all of the data into one book. So that was kind of my objective or goal with this particular book. Um, now if I could get a little bit melodramatic here for a second, I like to recite uh, one of the introductory chap uh, paragraphs to my book because I think it kind of captures the mood and the spirit of the story. Um, Since the dawn of mankind, humans have glanced skyward, dreaming about life among the clouds, wondering what it would be like to escape our earthbound existence and soar effortlessly through the clouds like the birds, bats, bugs, and other creatures that have evolved in defiance of gravity. It is true that we have managed to devise vessels that can take us great distances through the air to faraway lands. But this is not the natural order of things. Without these constructs, we are confined by both gravity and evolutionary design to remain earthbound. So then, what are we to make of the many, many accounts of human-like creatures flying overhead? The conceptual synthesis of human and avian characteristics dates back about 17,300 years. And according to radiocarbon dating, that is the age of the famous cave paintings at Lascaux in France. Uh, these particular illustrations were done by Paleolithic humans, presumably. And most of the illustrations, and there are thousands of them, portray known animal species, things like buffaloes, woolly rhinoceroses, horses, and so forth, animals they were familiar with. But in one particular location in the Lascaux caves, there is this figure which is known as the Birdman of Lascaux. And it's in an area known as the Well. And there's, it's been the subject of a lot of conjecture and speculation as far as what this figure represents. Um, and essentially what it is is a human-like figure with the head of a bird. Now, this is known as an anthropomorphic figure. Anthropomorphic means blending human characteristics, physical characteristics, with those of an animal or beast. And we find many examples of that in different mythologies all over the world. Um, this particular figure, the Birdman of Lascaux, is again a human-like figure. He has four fingers on each hand. He seems to be kind of falling backwards in an ecstatic trance while you have this rushing sort of buffalo in front of him and also an erect phallus. I guess this is kind of a, the PG-13 section of my, uh, <laughs> of my lecture. Um, you know, it's thought that it may represent some form of early shamanism or spiritualism. Um, but shamanism was believed by anthropologists to have evolved much later in human culture. So we don't really know. But again, it's just an illustration that at least at that point, 17,000 years ago, um, 
Paleolithic humans were starting to blend human and avian or bird-like characteristics. Now, in antiquity, we can find many, many references to anthropomorphic sentient beings in different mythologies all over the world. And that's one of the things that's really fascinating to me is that it seems to be a cross-cultural sort of global phenomenon uh, relating to different mythologies and folklores. For example, in the 9th century BC, we can find bas-reliefs of these beings known as the Apkalu or Avgal. And this, uh, these were made by the ancient Sumerians, in the, you know, basically the first civilization. Uh, the Apkalu or Avgal were typically portrayed as human-like figures, but oftentimes they were depicted as having wings, both wings and the head of a raptor type of bird like an eagle, falcon, or what have you. The Apkalu were viewed as both protectors and sages. And these particular bas reliefs were usually placed in areas of uh, um, in palaces, near tombs, and you know, since they were viewed as protectors, I guess they were sort of symbolic of that particular thing. Um, it should also be pointed out that the ancient Sumerians um, also believed or worshipped uh, deities known as the Anunnaki. And those of you who are very much into the ancient aliens um, and, and that sort of belief system will understand that the Anunnaki are uh, essentially you know, beings from the sky that came down and sort of nurtured civilization and, and started humankind according to that, that particular belief. So the Apkalu are somewhat related to the, the Anunnaki in a sense. They are the children of the Anunnaki. Um, Here's one for, uh, for any fans of The Exorcist we have out here. This is Pazuzu. Pazuzu is the Assyrian wing demon, wind demon, I'm sorry. Um, Pazuzu, this is a, a figurine or a fetish of Pazuzu. Pazuzu was often just uh, usually depicted as, oh, sorry, the laser here. Um, a man-like form with four wings, the head of a dog, and <coughs> There's that erect phallus again. I'm sorry, that keeps popping up, doesn't it? Um, and the right hand is always displayed in an upright position for some reason. Pazuzu was greatly feared. Pazuzu was basically associated with disaster, famine, inclement weather, and so forth. So basically a very bad omen or harbinger of, of bad cataclysmic events. And I'm just going to point out at this point, this is one of the recurring themes that will talk about here as we discuss these flying humanoid creatures is that even dating back to the ancient Assyrians, this belief that the appearance of a winged humanoid form is essentially a very bad omen. Um, in Hindu and Buddhist culture, we, f we find Garuda. Uh, Garuda is a very, very uh, prevalent figure in uh, Hindu and Buddhist folklore and, and writings. Uh, Garuda is usually described two different ways. Oftentimes a human-like, oh, I keep doing that, sorry, I'm not used to this fancy laser thing. Uh, human-like form, golden in color with massive wings. And in some stories, of course, the size of the wings is exaggerated. They're a mile long or whatever. Um, oftentimes Garuda is described as just a gigantic bird as well. But um, there's just many, many examples of this in mythologies all over the world. For example, in the Americas, the ancient Zapotec and Maya worshiped this guy, Kamazots, or Zots, which means the death bat. And Zots was often associated with sacrifice and death, bloodshed. Uh, they would, of course, make sacrifices to some of their gods. Uh, Kamazots was kind of a mixture of human and bat-like characteristics, kind of a bat-like face, bat-like wings, and, uh, but a human-like, clearly a human-like form. Um, in Japanese folklore, we find the Tengu. The Tengu are sort of uh, mischievous forest spirits, sometimes dangerous to humans, but oftentimes kind of playful, like fairies or, or elves, something like that. Uh, but again, uh, many, many uh, stories dating back to the, the Middle Ages and uh, typically a, a, a man-like form, well, jumping ahead here, with a beak and wings. There are different types of, of Tengu, but um, descriptions are, are somewhat generalized. Uh, of course, many of you probably are thinking of angels from the Bible.